Good morning. You're watching Joy News Desk coming to you live from our studio here at Coco Mimle. This is Joy News Desk with me, Sweetie Abochi. We're also live on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 125. In today's headlines, committee probing plot to oust IGP, clears IGP, and indicts three senior police officers. We have details of a draft copy of the committee's report. Chief of Senyase and Kontihene of Brekum invites the CEO of Semenshia Learning and Development Farm to a meeting over a notice from the traditional council to relocate his goat farm due to an age-old custom forbidding the rearing of livestock in the community. Reclamation efforts take off to restore Apamprama Forest Reserve after the destruction of over 40% of the national resource by activities of illegal miners. We have an update from our Poisoned for Gold documentary. You want to stay with us for the details and more, including business in this hour. Don't go away. And now the news in detail. We begin, we have information available to join news at the investigations into the alleged plot to remove the IGP. Dr. George Kufu Dampare reveals that the Parliament's ad hoc committee has established damning findings against the officers involved and recommending their prosecution. This is contained in a leaked draft report by the committee. And my colleague, Samo Mbura, has been following the story and has more. He joins us via Zoom with details. Mumbara, give us a recap of the mandates of this committee, their terms of reference and methodology to unravel this alleged plot to remove the IGP. Well, we know that this issue sometime last year, about seven months ago, there was this uh, leaked audio circulating, um, capturing some police officers allegedly plotting the removal of the IGP, Dr. George Akufudampari, involving a top politician of the NPP, the former Northern Regional Chairman, Daniel Bugrinabu. So Parliament's ad hoc committee was established to look into it. And these were the terms and reference, uh, terms of reference that they were supposed to uh, work on. They were to ascertain the veracity or otherwise of the leaked tape, uh, to also investigate the conspiracy to remove the current Inspector General of Police, to investigate any other matter contained in the audio recording. They were also to recommend sanctions to persons found culpable where appropriate and to make recommendations for reforms where necessary. Additionally, the committee has been tasked to make such other recommendations and consequential orders as the committee may deem uh, appropriate. So what happened was we witnessed the, uh, all the witnesses involved testifying before the committee, both uh, in public hearing and in camera. So we, uh, the committee invited um, Chief Bugrinabu, who was a star witness, of this particular leaked tape, George Asari, superintendent, is uh, with the Ghana Police Service and one of the officers allegedly involved in this plot. He was invited. The second one was uh, Superintendent George, uh, I mean, Eric Jebi. Uh, he also appeared before the committee. COP Alex Mensah, who is now retired, also appeared. He was, a, uh, I mean, the star witness in this case alongside um, Mr. Bugri Nabu uh, there. So he was the one that the plot was to favor that if Dampare is removed, he would take over as the IGP. So all these people appeared before the committee, including the IGP himself, Dr. George Akufudan Pari. And then later, the National Security Minister, uh, Albert Kandapa, was invited. But that one was an in-camera hearing. The reason they invited the National Security Minister was the fact that the, his ministry had already launched an investigation into the matter before the Parliament Ad Hoc Committee uh, came in. So um, the uh, witnesses were acquitted and discharged along the line. And then, before Parliament went on recess, there was a meeting, a final meeting by the committee, uh, where the, a draft report was presented to read by the clerks. And then they made recommendations that there were certain information captured, information captured in the report that um, were not accurate, so they should be expunged. So, that was the suggestion by some of the committee members until Parliament went on recess. And it is on the back of that that this issue uh, 
uh, came up. The leaked, uh, um, I mean, report uh, came up and then making some damning revelations about the investigation so far. Well, so now let's look at the analysis of the issues by the committee. What are the fact findings? Well, so the facts finding are that, as I indicated earlier, on the terms of references of the committee, they were to authenticate the audio um, that was in circulation. And indeed, per what we have, not just relying on what has been channeled out in the media and our, our sources within the committee, suggest that the committee has indeed authenticated the audio tapes submitted by uh, Chief Bugri Nabu and what was also presented to them by the Speaker of Parliament, who taxed them to do this job as evidence for the investigation. Now, all four key witnesses, including Chief Bugri Nabu and three senior officers, uh, confirmed the authenticity of their voices in the audio tapes. You know, in the early stage of this particular investigation, um, the uh, offenders or the accusers of the, um, the IGP denied that that portions of the audio were not there, but eventually the committee has been able to establish that. So uh, the committee is also saying that the senior police officers really conspired to remove the IGP Dr. Akufudan Pare based on unfounded political affiliations aiming to replace him with COP Alex Mensah, who is now retired. Uh, the leaked audio tape and testimony, according to what we have in the draft report of the committee, review that the senior police officers publicly declared their affiliation with the MPP violating the Police Service Act. Again, the committee is able to establish that indeed, lobbying initiated by the police officers through Chief Bugri Nabu aimed at removing the current IGP due to perceived threats to the MPP's electoral fortunes. You know, in the audio recordings, they were talking about how they need an IGP that can help the MPP break the AIDS in 2024. And the uh, committee has also been able to establish that the conspiracy to replace the IGP with a more compliant one has the potential to undermine the integrity of the 2024 general election. And they talks about the approach to election security management to compromise professionally within the Ghana Police Service and threaten democratic principles. And then uh, the most critical one is that the conspiracy to remove the IGP was deemed unethical, unprofessional, and a breach of professional uh, misconduct regulations. The uh, committee has established that COP Alex Mensa lied under oath about his MPP membership, later confirmed by his decision to contest a parliamentary seat for the NPP. You remember when COP Alex Mensa appeared before the committee, he uh, identified himself as a sympathizer with the NPP. Uh, but the committee has now established that um, after he picking the forms to contest the Bekwai seat, it goes to confirm that he was an active member of the MPP, but not a sympathizer. Um, I mean, exposing him for perjury or lying before oath that. That's what the committee has been able to establish per our sources. Now, um, the other one has to do with Superintendent George um, Asari and Superintendent Eric Emmanuel Jebi, who initially denied speaking to Chief Bugri Nabu, but later admitted their voices and participation in a phone call. So some of these uh, facts, uh, or these are the facts that the committee uh, actually came up out with uh, in together with the actions of the senior police officers aiming to undermine the IGP's office, reducing its stature into partisan politics, which is strongly uh, condemned. So these were the, or these are the facts that have been established by the uh, ad hoc committee in parliament that we have laid hands on. All right, so aside or in addition to these facts, did the committee make any recommendations? Well, the foremost recommendation that the committee has made has, uh, has to do with the prosecution for perjury and professional misconduct of the three senior officers involved in the conspiracy to remove the IGP. And these three officers are COP Alex Mensah, uh, George Asari, uh, Ch Chief Superintendent, and then Chief Superintendent um, Eric JB. We know that COP Alex Mensah is already on retirement. Uh, so he has left the Ghana police at seven, but two officers are still serving. And they are also proposing a review or an amendment of the constitutional and the legislative provisions to secure the independence of the IGP's office. Uh, also suggesting that they, there should be alignment in, in terms and conditions of the IGP with the justice of the Court of Appeal with a non-renewable tenure after compulsory retirement at 60. We know that the current IGP is not up to 60 years. So what the committee is suggesting is that once you are appointed 
as the IGP and even you are 40 years, 45 years, you should travel as the IGP till you are 60 years, the compulsory retirement age that you can go. It should not be subject to the president's decision that this person should come in, this person should go. There's also an advocacy specific grounds for the removal of a sitting IGP, emphasizing that the grounds an IGP should be removed should be based on misbehavior, incompetence, or incapacity. There's also a call for enactment of the Code of Conduct for Public Officers Bill to address these conflicts of interest and emphasizing transparency in the deployment of security personnel for election security management and accountability for unprofessional conduct. There is also a recommendation for professional training of police officers on legal policy and normative frameworks collaborating with um, relevant stakeholders. And then they are calling for an urgent establishment of an independent police complaint uh, commission. We know that the police already has a, a professional bureau, what they call the PPSB. That's the Professional Police Standard Bureau. So they rather want an independent one that will not only have police officers there, but people with different backgrounds constituting that particular um, commission All to right, deal with we'll misconduct in the Ghana Police Thank Service. You so so much. the last one has to do with the existing provision. James Agalga is Vice Chairman of Parliament's Ad Hoc Committee. He joins us with details on this developing story. Mr. Agalga, thanks for joining us. We've seen a draft report. How soon should we expect the final report? Well, before Parliament went on recess, uh, they have actually received a draft report uh, from our Secretariat, the clerks. Um, we, we, we looked at it, made certain uh, inputs so that um, you know, the draft report would be reviewed and resubmitted for further consideration. I mean, that was uh, what we did before we went on research. So as I speak, the committee has not got or come up with the final report which would be laid before the plenary situation. Okay, so to what extent are the details about the bit clearing the IGP of and indicting other senior officers valid? He wants us to, to discuss the content of the draft report. You know, the thing about draft report uh, is that it's not a final report. As changes could be made. And I did say that when a draft report was submitted to the committee before we went to say, some inputs were made. They said that certain changes be effected. Now, that is yet to be done. Once that hasn't been done and a, uh, a draft be submitted for our federal constitution, I, I don't think I should have into details at this point. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll bring you more details as this is a developing story. Keep watching. Now, the chief of Senyasi and... Co the chief of Senyasi and Kuntihini of Burekum is inviting the owner of a goat farm under pressure to relocate his livestock due to an age-old custom to a meeting that will provide a possible solution to the problem. Joining his investigations points to an ultimatum which elapsed last year, ordering residents to remove all goats from the town. CEO of Semencia Learning and Development Farm, Frederick Bene, says he has been given two weeks to relocate because the gods of Brekum forbid the rearing of goats in the town. But the chief of the town says he's not aware of any such orders from the traditional council. Osahene Asuma Ajemang Sabi says Semencia Farms should sit with Nananom to look at possible solutions. Lava Femmes Erastus Asari Donko has been following this development in Brekum and has filed this report. Brekum, an old town in the Buno region, set up as a security post by the Ashantis. You could keep cattle, sheep, any type of bird or animal, but it's a taboo to rear goats. No matter how strange it sounds, traditional authorities and some indigents like Antebedu who came to the town in the 60s believe the river deity, Asiokra, Cast this misfortune on whoever rears goats in the town. Baby, ya, na na nambetsi na ya, yenye zuri mwa ya, yenye dini vuri kumuno. 
Do you think you will fare well if you rare goats in the town where our forefathers came to settle and got the name Brekum? No, no Brekum indigen will prosper if he rears goats. They will be hit by calamities and misfortune. Others have been told fatal accidents occur in the town due to the presence of goats. There used to be frequent road accidents and Ananom consulted oracles and came to the conclusion that the presence of the goats was responsible. As for us, we don't know anything about the spiritual realm, so whatever they tell us, we follow. We are told a recent enforcement of the custom led to many removing their goats. Some are not happy with the directive. Seriously, I am not happy with the directive to remove the goats from the town. I used to rear goats, and I have gone bankrupt after we were forced to remove the goats. That is a very, you know, stressful moment for us at the moment. One of the affected is Chief Executive Officer of Semencia Learning and Development Farm, Frederick Bene. He tells John News he's been given an ultimatum to move his over 250 breeds of goats from the town. In fact, when we heard this, it was a very stressful um, story to us, you know, because we had never dreamt that such a tradition that has been abandoned for years will be revoked again this time as we are going forward. Unfortunately, after a series of back and forth discussion, they still insisted that we move from here and have been given a strong warning of two weeks to vacate, otherwise they will send people here to kill all our animals. This one staring at me right now is the bois goat. It's a fascinating breed of goats. He's part of about 250 goats, different breeds, different types, brought in by Sementia Farms. But will I say great investment, wrong destination? Because the town, Brekum, hates goats. This is Snasi, which of course is part of 38 communities in the Brekum traditional council that hates goats because Asiokra, the river deity, which is some few meters away from here, doesn't like goats. It's a taboo to rear goats. You can bring in a goat, slaughter it and eat it. You can bring the meat into town, but you cannot create this in Brekum. And that is the subject of controversy at the moment. But the chief of Snase and Kontihine of Brekum, Osahine Asomajiman Sebi, wants Semencia Farms to meet Nananum for an amicable resolution. I don't know whoever gave him that order because we haven't met on it at the traditional council level, and that place happens to be the highest decision body for the traditional council. We haven't met and we haven't taken any decision over his removal from. Uh, our school land. So I would just advise him, he should come down and let's talk and see how best. Uh, because if the land will reject you, uh, you wouldn't have been there by now. Like by now we have removed you all the time. If So what I'm saying is that there's still room for improvement. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaredonko, Brekum, Bono region. Erastus Asari Donko there. Now, illegal miners have destroyed between 40 and 50 percent of one of the biggest forest reserves in the Ashanti region. As part of efforts to reclaim the Apamprama Forest Reserve, 
The Forestry Commission has granted Unipower Mining Company an entry permit to begin a pilot forest restoration project. Through its reclamation consultant, Better Land Company Limited, 10 hectares of the degraded forest is being restored. Love FM's Asar Irastos Asaridonko again monitored progress of work and has filed this report. The Apamprama Forest Reserve, previously a biodiversity hotspot, cultural heritage and a high climate mitigation ecosystem has been reduced largely to a wasteland by illegal mining. Thousands of hectares of the forest, about 40 to 50 percent of this valuable resource is gone. Uh, the Apamprama Forest there has been under siege by illegal miners. So for some years now, I can say almost about 40 to 50 percent of the forest area is gone. This has brought negative climate-induced hardship on farmers and residents of communities around the reserve. It is the forest that gives farmers in this area rain to farm. But now, if God doesn't intervene, we will not have the rain to grow our crops. According to experts, the soil is contaminated with heavy metals, mainly arsenic. A typical area that we shouldn't have seen traces of heavy metal and to be specific arsenic. Arsenic is naturally occurring element however with little disturbance that we do to the soil or the land it can come by itself. Experts say it will take over a century to return the Apamprama Forest Reserve to its ecological function. But a reclamation expert is leading a number of young people employed from one of the affected towns, Odahun, to restore compartments 2, 3, 18 and 19. Unipar Mining Company has an entry permit from the Forestry Commission for the pilot project. From a degraded land full of pits and gullies, they have used the same soil in the land area to level up. They are also preserving some of the artificial water-filled pits created by illegal mining to serve as wetlands within a new ecosystem being created to replace the old one. The plan, according to experts, is to grow trees with the ability to extract poisonous heavy metals from the soil over time. The species that we are planting, typically, the mahogany species, the oframo, they have the ability, the potential to absorb and to uptake these heavy metals from the soil. The uh, Cedrella odorata that we've made is a fast growing species. Within a short period of time, there's a litter fall and that will decompose and add nutrient to the soil. Again, it will promote shade for the other uh, uh, seed. We are not adopting single plantation or what we call pure stand. We are going in for a mist stand and for a mist stand it is very robust and at the end of the day we can achieve the integrity of the ecosystem that we want to achieve. The experts say they hope to catch the eye of government and funding agencies after the pilot to be able to cover the entire degraded forest and beyond. David William Alan Thomas is the project director for Better Land Company Limited, consultants for the pilot reclamation project. We've set up a nursery um, to grow more of the seedlings in preparation for when we're ready to plant them. We've also got a research area where we're trying different samplings to see how well they may grow in this particular terrain. So that's what we're doing. We, we, we believe that it has to be addressed and we're hopeful that if we can show that it can be done properly, that we may secure funding um, internally or externally, hopefully internally, so we can continue this project. Because if it's not addressed, the land will just completely lie fallow. And that's an absolute shame for, for Ghana. 
the Forestry Commission is supervising this pilot exercise. Ernest Adofo is Bekwai District Forest Manager. We demarcated the compartment into a 10 hectare block to make it easy for us to monitor the activity. So the first 10 hectare plot is what the company is reclaiming now. The earthwork is completed. They've uh, done almost about 90% uh, of the pegging and then planting is almost about 80%. So the project is uh, progressing very well. And then one encouraging thing that they've done at the area is how they are using drip irrigation to at least provide water for the seedlings planted during the dry season. And I think that is perfectly, it's, it's marvelous. And we are satisfied with whatever the company is doing over there. For now, the youth of Odahon, some of whom were young when the devastation of their Pamprama Forest Reserve occurred, are happy being part of its restoration. This marks the beginning of the restoration of the devastated Apamprama Forest Reserve. Should government be satisfied with this pilot project, then it will be extended to the devastated lands of the Apamprama Forest Reserve. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Apamprama Forest Reserve, Odaho, Ashanti Region. That's an update on Erastus Asaridonko's Poison for Gold documentary. It's good to see that uh, there are some efforts toward restoring our forests. Now to the uh, Bono East region now, where farmers in communities in the Pru East district are relying on tractors to cut foodstuff to the district's capital for sale. Due to the poor nature of roads in the area, tracks and tricycles used in the transportation of farm produce have deserted the area. The farmers have to pay more for the services of the limited tractors, leading to a rise in food costs. Nanaya Ojima throws a spotlight on the roads and filed this report. After waiting several days without accessing a tractor, some farmers opted for a tricycle in an attempt to get their foodstuff to the market. At the time of our visit, the tricycle carting the foodstuff had broken down. Navigating the sandy road is difficult for the tricycle, which has spent two days on the 120-kilometer road. We waste too much fuel on this road due to its nature. It is slippery, and for that reason, our vehicle is always faulty. We are farmers. We are carton rice and other foodstuff to the market. Our truck continues to develop faults. We have spent two days on this stretch. The local assembly has often reshaped the road to keep it more trouble. Unfortunately, the intervention has made little impact as the road gets dusty in the dry season and muddy for vehicular movement in the rainy season. Here are some people plying the road. In the rainy season, we can't travel on motorbikes and the vehicles refuse to ply the road. After the road was reshaped, it has become unmotorable. We are not able to transport our farm produce to the market. She says, I came here to buy yam to sell. Since no truck is willing to ply the road, I am stuck here. You have to put on your headlight even in the afternoon before you can see the oncoming vehicle. It is risky plying the road because of the dust. Meanwhile, some politicians have started campaigning in these communities ahead of the 2024 general elections. Parliamentary candidate for the National Democratic Congress. Emmanuel Kwekubuam is worried about the nature of the road. Year of roads. Pru is deserved its first day of the year of roads. Let us know exactly what you guys are doing about it. See, even in the midst in the district capital, 
where um, uh, before 2020 elections, they brought a contractor to construct culverts, to construct the uh, drainage system. I still tell you that the road is just about 20% completed. And the rest of the 80%, where is it? Only the covers, that is what you term as year of roads. Please, you cannot scam the Ghanaian. You can't scam the populace. You can't continue to lie to us in the face in the name of year of roads and tell us we are doing infrastructure activities or infrastructure development. Meanwhile, the people of Ku East are yet to even benefit from what you so call the year of roads. For Joy News, Nanea Ojima reporting. In other stories, in a bid to make a compelling case to be returned for a second term as the parliamentary aspirant for the NPP in the Kwesi Mintim constituency, the member of parliament for the area, Dr. Prince Hamid Amma, ahead of the impending new patriotic party primaries on January 27th, has launched his campaign dubbed Breaking the Four to Break the Eight to ensure continuity in development in Kwesi Mintim. The Kwesimin team constituency since 2012 has had its members of parliament serving only one term, although it remains a stronghold of the new patriotic party. However, as the party prepares to go to parliamentary primaries, the incumbent MP, Dr. Prince Samid Ama, is seeking to remain as the legislator launching his campaign, the vice chair of education committee in parliament made a compelling case of the development he has been able to achieve as a first time MP, which should not be truncated. According to him, his distinct performance in parliament and deliverables are worth of second tenor. I believe that in the last three years, um, I have done exceedingly well to warrant a second term. Um, the purpose of today's launch is to make a compelling case for my second term and for the reason why not only the polling station executives and constituency executives or the party delegates, but also the entire community to rally behind me. Um, so essentially I attempted to demonstrate the, the work I had done or I have done um, starting from um, Wendo, all over the communities across the constituency. I've done a project there. And so the, I, I made a strong case for me to be given a second term to be able to move the constituency forward. Some of his constituents endorsed his candidature and touted some of his accomplishments for which he deserves a second term. What he has done aside job opportunities, what he has been doing for the constituency too, we have some in the book here, which is the evidence. Building of schools, building of health facilities for the constituency. We are going to vote for him and vote for him again. He's the finest MP that we have had. Within all these years, just three years, he has done much and so much for us. I will say it and say it again. If we are going to vote for him and vote for him again. And I'm we are showing you that Dr. Amma will win massively. Uh, more than three years that he has been an MP and what he has done is marvelous. We have not seen something like that in the constituency before. Yeah, and apart from that, the post twenty has, the, uh, 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 has been embarking on one term project, one term project. This time around, we don't want all these things to happen again. We are pushing for an MP, a youthful MP who will go forward, like maybe more years that the post twenty will benefit. From. Yeah, so these are the many things that we are pushing for the second term of the year. Traditional leaders in the constituency have made a passionate appeal to delegates not to hesitate but vote and retain the Member of Parliament, Dr. Prince Hamid Amma, for him to continue addressing the mirage of developmental challenges in the area. Here is Chief of Kwesimin Team, Nana Isan. <laughs> On a 
for joy news in Athalia Kwanza, Kwisimintin. Your election headquarters is brought to you by Petrosol, your clean fuel in full quantity. Now moving on, government says it will, by end of this year, complete phase one of its digital youth village project. Hosted by the University of Ghana, the ultra-modern information communication technology infrastructure is earmarked to be a center of excellence, creativity and innovation. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, who championed the agenda of digitalization, says the Digital Youth Village Project will add to the commitment of the government to transform the country using the power of technology. He made a remark at the annual New Year School and Conference at the University of Ghana. Nurturing the resilience, adopting technology and embracing humanism for sustainable development. That's the focus of the annual New Year School at the University of Ghana. Vice Chancellor Professor Nana Abba Amfo says information and communication technologies could bring about the best outcomes for national development. I consider the theme for those years New Year School and Conference holistic bringing into sharp focus essential attributes such as humanism and resilience, which when deployed together with technology is likely to deliver the best outcomes for national development. As a university poised to distinguish itself as a leading university in Ghana and among highly ranked universities globally, UG has embraced technology not only as part of our work processes, but also as an integral part of our institutional culture. The government of Ghana over the years has championed the digitalization agenda with the Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Obamia at the forefront. The head of Ghana's economic management team says leveraging the power of ICT would promote inclusion and social equity. Digitalization and technology is a vehicle for including the excluded in society. It gives transparency. If you look at what we went through in Ghana for 60 years after independence, between 1957 and 2017, the system that developed excluded so many people. If you needed a passport, <laughs> you had to go and pay a bribe. If you needed a driver's license, the same to go, so many things were taking place that were excluding the poor, the vulnerable, and the dispossessed. And so we are now moving towards a new system that includes the poor so that you can apply for many services. The University of Ghana is expected to see a face lift later this year as the vice president reveals that a digital youth village will be constructed to serve as a center of excellence and innovation. We are committed to the construction of the Digital Youth Village as announced with the provisions made in the 2024 budget. This initiative is intended to boost digital entrepreneurship among the nation's youth. The Digital Youth Village is poised to be a center of excellence for learning innovation and creativity. The annual New Year School is expected to deliberate on national development through the use of information communications technologies. We'll pause here for a brief break. Join News Desk returns. Still keep watching. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. 
Finance Minister Ken Ofriata says Ghana should expect to receive a draft term sheet from official creditors for the restructuring of the country's $5.4 billion of bilateral debts. So according to him, the term sheet will be sufficient for the country to seek International Monetary Fund board approval later this month for a $600 million disbursement under the Extended Credit Facility Program. The official creditors met on Monday to discuss the restructuring of $5.4 billion dollars of the country's loans. Ms. Ofriata told Bloomberg that the term sheet will be good enough for the IMF to continue its work, adding Ghana is in good shape. Ghana's dollar bonds maturing in 2027 rose by 1.3 percent to 43.88 cents on the dollar after the news that the country will get uh, term sheets yesterday. In other news, the Ghana Financial Stability Fund has advanced its first support of 2.5 billion cities to a commercial bank in the country. This came in the form of a bond to help the bank recapitalize. Joe Jaffe has details. After this local commercial bank met all the requirements needed for the Financial Stability Fund to extend the support to the institution. Now, this is not coming in the form of fiscal cash but the bond that has been issued by the government of Ghana to help the bank meet the proposed minimum capital requirements for commercial banks in the country by the Bank of Ghana. Joy Business understands that the support should be seen as equity in this bank rather than debt. Therefore, the Bank of Ghana is expected to classify this transaction as if the bank in question has taken steps to meet the expected minimum capital requirements commercial banks in the country by the regulator. The Financial Stability Fund kickstart work last year without the necessary support from the World Bank that should have brought in some $250 million. Government claims he has already invested some $750 million to set up the fund supposed to assist financial institutions and commercial banks hit badly by the shocks the domestic debt exchange program. Our government, through the Ministry of Interior, will intensify moves to ensure that all businesses operating in the uh, locksmith industry are licensed and well regulated. This is a move by the Ministry to sanitize the system as well as save lives and properties. Head of Public Affairs at the Ministry of Interior, Al Haji Zak Musa, told Joy Business the time has come for all businesses operating in the sector to be recognized. The idea is to let them know that they have to follow the rules and regulations or the laws governing their operations, because there are laws governing their operations. With the, all these private security rubber stamp, they must register or renew their license with the Ministry of the Interior. Our record shows that some of them are not, but they are in the system operating, which is against the law. You cannot operate private security business in this country without recourse to the Ministry of the Interior. So we are calling on them, all those who have not registered. If you have registered and your license is expired, come to the Ministry and renew for you to be in business. Because at the end of the day, what we are doing is for the benefit of the country. And if you are not doing the right thing, then who else can you go and talk to that or ask to do the right thing? So we are all Ghanaians or the good people of Ghana doing business in this country. We are not in a monitoring exercise to sort of uh, tarnish somebody's business or stop somebody. No, we want business to thrive. But at the end of the day, the right thing must also uh, uh, be done. We cannot compromise security in this country. So at the end of the day, the right thing must be done. So all these things, all these businesses, people who have not registered or renew, we are calling on them to come and re uh, renew or register with the Ministry of the Interior to avoid uh, sanctions. And that's it for the segment, the news returns after the break. Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching Joy News Desk here on Joy News, your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. Now we cross over to Tamale, where Shefeila is in uh, 
Still in the kitchen cooking, over 200 hours of cooking. My colleague Lois Adeyemi Shola is on. Lois, if you can hear me, what can you report from Tamale? All right, so um, good morning. And um, we're still on ground here. She just clocked 226 hours and she is finally done with the cookathon. But um, because she is cooking a meal, so before she um, hit the 226 hours, she was preparing Jollof, okay, and she's not done. So she's still in the kitchen, whipping it up, um, about to serve. But aside that, a lot of people are here, Tamale, the whole place is packed. The modern city hotel where the quicker one is happening is extremely full with people, um, traditional leaders, celebrities. Everybody is here, politicians, they are all here to support her because, I mean, at the end of the day, she's been standing on the plate for 10 good days and um, she's finally ended the quicker one. Is there any activity to climax uh, ending the cookathon? Is there a party happening? What, how do you end the whole event? Of course there is a party. I mean, Tamale people have, they love to have fun. And uh, I mean, they're crowning her, her victory with an after party. So hopefully between the hours of uh, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. we should have kick-started it. But from now, she will come out, we have a little press conference, and then um, a few donations will be given to her. Too. We will hear from her experience how it has been you get to chit chat with her a little bit but yes of course tamale is uh, the party is on tamale today so obviously we are having an after party to celebrate it what can you tell us about her strength this is an endurance uh, marathon what can you tell us about her strength having been in the kitchen for 226 hours i cannot uh, say enough how much this woman has been strong her resilient every time i I report, I always say that this one's resilience is one that is to be studied. Because so since they want the consistency, the strength, if you watch closely between the hours of 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., you see a little, you know, show of weakness. It is, it is quite um, normal because it's not easy to be standing on your feet, especially at dawn. Our body is not programmed that way. But this woman, after 4 a.m., she's good to go. She's back in the kitchen by 6 She's um, whipping up meals. I mean, between 226 hours, she's cooked 153 meals and said 3,000 dishes. And she's done that standing on her feet, and she hasn't broken a sweat. So anybody here, we've spoken to her medical team, and they said if we leave her, she can cook to the 6th of March, and we'll have to beg her to come out of the kitchen. That's how strong this woman is. It's just because she's been standing on her feet, and everyone is beginning to get worried that she's ending this quickly. But, I mean, she has... Um, hasn't broken any sweat. She's still physically strong, and there's nothing really wrong with her. The only thing is that she has lost a little weight, which is quite normal because she's been standing on her feet for long, and she's not eating as uh, heavy as she normally would. So the banku, the toes of feet, she hasn't really been eating those. But um, aside that, she's physically fine. The resilience is one that I, I am a woman, you are a woman, and you know it's very easy, and I think that um, it should be studied. Before I let you go, Lois, have your palates been lucky enough to taste any of the meals? Oh, I have. I have. How was had, it? I have had a chance to eat her jollof. I have said it so many times that it is good. The first day, it was amazing. The last day, it's still amazing. I mean, the last food she's cooking right now is jollof. And trust that I am going to eat it and I'm going to enjoy myself because her finest food um, is top notch. So not only me, we've had politicians eat as well. The um, chief of staff was here. She tasted that we have menu, SDK, a lot of people have come here to taste the food. Everyone that comes says that it's amazing. She's also extended the food even to the street. We fed the alternatives, she fed uh, people on the street beggars, and all of them attest to the fact that this woman's cooking is top notch. The fact that she's cooking for a long or longer hours doesn't stop her from, you know, producing quality meals. So, yes, the food is good, and I cannot wait to taste my jello. Well, thank you so much. You can also follow more on Joy Prime for details of how the um, ceremony comes to an end. This is how we wrap up for Joy News Desk. My name is Sweetie Abochi. For more news, log on to myjoyonline.com. Join us at 12 noon for Joy News today for more news.